I think the systemic community wants to read and they don't always know quite how to find things that feel readable, relevant, dialogical. Um, something happened in our journals a few years ago, maybe, at a time when the systemic field really, really needed to defend itself to survive by immersing itself in creating and producing evidence-based uh, practice data, which was a, resulted in a lot of uh, papers in journals needing to address and showcase uh, supporting evidence of how systemic practice can make a difference. So it was outcome research. And a lot of those reports were written from what John Schotter would have called an aboutness position. And Peter Stratton did an amazing job as the after research star in creating score, uh, promoting it, encouraging people and training people in using it and other methods besides to generate a strong evidence base. And the profession in part survives because of that era. But one of the side effects of that was that our journals got also caught up in something called the impact factor um, of needing to uh, demonstrate that they were worthy of a higher impact factor, that they could be referenced internationally, their publications referenced internationally. And what that meant is that people had to then write in a certain, well, I'm going to put it like this, depersonalized style, a dissociated style that we allied ourselves with a certain story of what counted as academic, and we lost ourselves. Reading should be a dialogical process. It's, it's you in dialogue as a reflexive, thinking, reactive, responsive person with the writer. It's not you being talked at, and a lot of the uh, research reports a lot of the uh, aboutness uh, reporting on systemic practice from without, as if they could, that same research could have been done by anybody, not a systemic therapist, um, meant that people were sort of back in school being taught a subject that they had to get, they had to absorb the facts of. They're back in a sort of modernist framework. People love to read stories. And stories are not any less important than numbers. Numbers are also stories. And it's very important to remember that, that quantitative data is an, another way of telling a story. But it's often put in a certain genre that means that the stories are not very interesting. You need a good narrative. And we are narrative people. We listen to stories. We listen to the politics in and behind and around the story. And we consider what Michael White would have said is narratives or stories that are also present, not yet told. That's part of our ethic. It's not just a political thing. Systemic therapy is a very ethical practice. And our reading as critical and reflexive readers is also an ethical activity. It's a learning activity, but we're not just passive absorbers of knowledge. And I think in this era, which we needed to go through of generating evidence-based publications, we felt de-skilled, we felt dissociated, um, and also worse, and this is maybe moving on to the subject of writing, we didn't feel that we could contribute because our papers were on practice as practitioners not quantitative stories of success, but more qualitative stories of success, that those stories wouldn't see the light of day. And that's resulted in us not seeing ourselves as writer contributors. And I think beforehand, in earlier days, certainly when I was looking at Human Systems Journal of uh, Consultation and Management, it, um, 
which KCC and Leeds Family Therapy Research Institute Centre generated. That, that was a journal where every person who came through KCC would be encouraged to turn their final dissertation into a publication. Peter Stratton wrote guidelines on how to turn your dissertation into a, a, um, a publication. And people became names through their work, their brilliant contributions. And I don't know quite who's doing that anymore. You've almost got to be a famous name or um, doing very traditional first order research in order to get published. So we're at a bit of a crossroads and part of setting up murmurations was to make sure we could, I think of murmurations more as a movement, the journal rather than just a journal, is to get the systemic community feeling like there is material they want to read that they can connect to and starting to see themselves as writers, contributors, um, again. I was also thinking about how there's three, three things. One, how writers are readers of their own work, not just of other people's texts. And how do we read others critically and really with a kind of a range of antenna to tune into what sits comfortably for us and what doesn't, what makes us angry or awkward or insecure uh, or happy or table thumping in agreement or disagreement. But we need to remember that we're also critical thinkers and that we come from different places, all of us, whether it's class, ethnicity, culture, um, religion, gender, sexuality, age, their intellectual abilities. There are many life experiences that we bring with us to our reading that create lenses. And if we don't honor those lenses and we don't read with and through those lenses, then we're just becoming some heteronormative, white, anthropocentric reader, trying to neutralize ourselves as if all our life experience doesn't matter. There are a number of exchanges that are happening at a level of inner dialogue and outer dialogue, power relations that are going on during reading as well. And it's very important, I think, that our systemic trainees feel a sense of entitlement to critique the texts that they're reading and to critique the curricula that they've been offered. There was a moment in my own doctorate which I did at KCC, it was the Professional Doctorate in Systemic Practice, um, which the Bed University of Bedfordshire now hosts and that I lead. It's like I hit a brick wall. I mean, really, it was like a physical sensation. And I realized I couldn't read another white man's text. And I just had a crisis. I didn't know what to do, where to go. I contacted a friend who was by now living in the States, and I said, this is what's going on. And she just said, oh my God, you should be reading. She gave me a huge list of really interesting women academics uh, from across the fields of systemic practice, qualitative requiry, indigenous studies, the creative arts, um, women who came from a range of other cultural and ethnic backgrounds. And then I started going, I started going to another conference, not just in the field of family therapy, where I felt I was just meeting people who were like me. And when I went to the International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry in the States, in Illinois, it felt like coming home. And I went many times and I took various people, colleagues, students with me. And we've now, not me personally, that I'm part of the committee, have brought the, the same conference to Europe. It's the European Congress of Qualitative Inquiry. There are a lot of counsellors and therapists who attend that because they understand counselling and therapy, reflexive counselling and therapy as opposed to method-led, as, as forms of inquiry, as ethical practices that are sort of connected to research. Anyway, the point is that I expanded my reading. I looked in other places and I realised that film 
and books, poetry. These were things that also spoke to me. In particular, I think the biggest learning, the biggest place to look for relevant reading for systemic therapy is not necessarily in our own productions, but looking to um, Indigenous studies, Black studies, other groups of people who are producing texts from within their own experience that are intended as counter-texts. They're not attempting to join the mainstream or be integrated in a mainstream way, so they become another ology or ism or whatever, but to hold their own territory so that they can write in the ways they need to write and maybe play the game and write in westernized academic ways of writing. Our reading lists, as Wanda Pillow would say, an indigenous American scholar, she would say that there's been a complete whiteout where there have been stunningly brilliant writers, women, black women, uh, indigenous women, Hispanic women, who have contributed, yet somehow there have been um, appropriation of those ideas and texts. And we end up reading the white men or white women who have incorporated those ideas and we now reference them as if. And that's probably true of even some of our systemic heroes. But I'm just saying we need to look more widely and not settle on that name and look at who else was writing in those years around that time. Who else were there in those friendship and collegial circles? Who's writing now? How do people speak? Maybe we do need to be looking to poetry. I noticed that in the pandemic, a systemic flux writing project that Murmurations Journal has set up. A lot of the Black contributors are writing in poetry. There are some things that need to be told or expressed or heard and felt in ways that the uh, traditional academic paragraphic form that lies flat and apparently neutral on the page simply doesn't touch, doesn't touch us, maybe conveys ideas and facts as though they're not a human thing, just a thing. So they exist separately from us and from the context of their production. I think writing takes many forms. So drawing is a form of creating a narrative. It can be either first order depiction, meaning I'm trying to show something how it really is, or it can be an expressive response, which is maybe more of a second order understanding of not representing, but representing with a hyphen. And if we're going to write for some of those journals where we're expected to, disso to dissociate, to enter into this very strange academic mental health condition um, of uh, uh, writing dissociation, where we leave ourselves out of the picture, then we're not writing as systemic practitioners. How could we? We couldn't then bring everything we know with us, all those ways of knowing that are to do with one's reactions in one's body, the stomach telling you something, the uh, suddenly sitting upright and paying a different kind of attention, the knowing how to breathe in and out. If we're going to tell stories about systemic practice, we have to create a good space around us. And that means writing with friends in your ears. And I don't mean uncritical friends, I mean people who really want to hear your story, who want to hear the connections you make. And also for the writer to feel a need to share something. There's no point writing just for the sake of it. And it writing, again, moves away from and between representational and representational to think again while one's writing. So writing allows us to develop new knowledge in, in and through a reflexive process of writing. It's not simply capturing and writing from an aboutness position. So we have to invent our own ways of talking about and from within practice in order to take our own learning further and that of our colleagues. One of the other conditions we need to do, uh, create for ourselves when writing 
is to get other voices out the room who are really not going to be helpful. They can come in later. They can be invited back in later to offer a critique. But for now, maybe it's important for people to really hear themselves and hear their many selves and hear the different selves that were happening during the conversation with whoever was in the room with them that maybe they're wanting to reflect on. And to reflect on the intrusion of critical voices, the voices that say that's permitted, that's not permitted, that's all to do with inner dialogue. And inner dialogue, of course, is it's not so much sequential. First I thought this, then I thought that, as though there's a single I and a single sequence as though everything happens chronologically. But we know that when we're thinking, lots of voices kick off in the same moment. It's more like, um, well, Bakhtin talked about polyphony, but I would say it's more like cacophony, that there are many chaotic interactions going on. And those interactions in our inner thoughts, um, in a dialogue, also have power relations going on between them with some voices, thoughts, ideas, feeling they have more entitlement to speak at any one point in time and be heard and find their way into outer talk. And writing slows things down. It allows for a different kind of real time. It's not real time in the sense of talking in live time, but it is real time because it, you're revisiting what else was going on. And that needs to find its way into print. Just looking at my, one of my worries about research um, into systemic practice is that if we only take what was said and fragment it up into coded elements, we're missing all of what I've just been describing. We're missing how we work, what we rely on in order to work. All our noticings of twitches and movements and our retractions are changing our sentences halfway, are deciding to use our breathing really differently and slow down how we, where we look, how we speak, who we address. This is, this is the, the fuel of how we work. This is what we work with. This is what we rely on. All this reflexive relational knowing. If it isn't in our texts, then we're not writing systemic therapy or any kind of systemic practice. People also need to think, what do they want to do with their writing? Because sometimes writing can be a really good form of self-supervision or therapy, a form of therapy for oneself, or just disentangling one's thoughts. It might be, for example, in some situations, if you're writing in poetry, a re-entangling, but a representing in a different way that makes another kind of sense to you at least as the writer. But the, one of the other things is how people either get published or develop a research project. And in order to get published, well, I suppose it's interesting to think, who am I wanting to reach? Why, do, why does it feel important to get this out there? One of my reasons for writing things is I haven't found anybody else writing those papers. So I'm, I'm in effect talking to myself, filling a gap that I would have loved to have read that paper. So in the very first paper that I wrote for publication, well, even in the chapter before that, I wrote a chapter called Working with People in Relationships, something like that. It was on doing couple therapy. And it was in a book called Pink Therapy. And it was on working with lesbian and gay and trans queer couples. And well, I was asked to write that. But I was writing a first. I was writing about working with queer couples from a systemic social constructionist point of view. That, that didn't exist. There just wasn't anything. So I wrote it because I was asked to and because I believed I had something to contribute. And I believed in the importance of systemic social constructionist ideas that challenged power, that challenged normative ideas about who counted, what counted as safe, healthy, normal, all that stuff and could promote a critique around theory. And by the time I wrote um, the paper, or the paper was published, actually I wrote it in 1993 as part of my own training at KCC. Uh, it was my dissertation, something about the social construction of the individual and the importance of group membership. That paper 
I wrote because I was frustrated because I was in an excellent training institute, but it was white, heteronormative, uh, and in that sense, really quite claustrophobic. I feel like pulling my arms in as I say that, you know, I'm feeling constrained as I remember that. And it wasn't that people weren't kind or interested. It was just the world that needed expanding a bit for at least for me to feel like I had some space. So that's why I started writing, because I felt constrained. I needed to honour my own thoughts and to allow them space to emerge. And writing is a place not for writing down one's thoughts so much as developing one's thoughts. And that's a really important distinction that people often, I think it's because when we were at school, a lot of people when they were at school were told, don't start writing until you know what you're going to say. Otherwise, there'll be a lot of crossings out, a lot of rubbing out, and the page will look really bad. But writing is a messy process. It needs to be. Because our preliminary thoughts, when we start to use words, we realize it's not the right word. It's not the right time for that thought. It needs to come in later. What's often missing from systemic writing is use of self. And it's not just a subject. It's a way of telling a story. Um, it's a way of putting ourselves in the story. And um, in order to do that, we need to be very honest, really transparent. We need to find a way of doing it without being disrespectful. So if other conversational partners in the text are telling us a moving story and we want to talk about, we want to be honest, we might need to talk about feeling distressed, feeling bored. We also have to think about what's the impact on other participants in the text reading this because I didn't mention this at the time. So then that brings us to the idea of how do we write with others in the text in a way that allows us to be honest. If we're going to understand systemic writing as a form of ethnography, which means study, using writing to study honestly, openly, in detail what's going on, not just out there, not just first order ethnography as conducted by early anthropologists, but second and third order ethnography in which we are putting ourselves in the picture. We are revealing who the observer narr narrator is. We're writing absolutely fully from within the doing to show the doing, to show the inner processes and the outer choices. Then we're looking more at something like autoethnography, relational ethnography. And these are ways of thinking. Re we can read about these subjects and we can find out more about how we're writing, not as a method of recording, that's for the notes, that's for the clinical record. And this is why writing isn't just the production of texts. It's a method of inquiry. Writing is an exploratory creative activity that can take our profession so much further.